You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this podcast. On today's podcast, we are joined by Ian McRae. Ian is a work psychologist, consultant, speaker, author, and managing director of High Potential Psychology. He works with and writes about a wide range of topics related to psychology and the workplace. And in today's podcast, we discussed his book, Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Work, Personality and Social Media. It was a very, very interesting conversation around assessing how people behave, talking about the difference between personality traits and personality disorders, some of the traits and disorders that we need to be aware of whether at work or with our family members and friends and just having an overall self-awareness when it comes to personality traits. It was a very very interesting discussion and it was one that I'm really looking forward to share with you all. If you haven't subscribed already please do to the channel every single week average a week (laughs) we release a podcast where we speak with authors about their books and the topics and ideas inside of it apologies that it's been nearly two weeks since the last podcast i've been doing study and exams have coming up for me so i've been busy doing that but you know i'm really excited to release this podcast with ian and once again please do like and subscribe for more podcasts coming up in the future and i really hope you enjoy this podcast ian it's a pleasure to have you on yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. This idea of uh, social media manipulation and human psychology um, and using, uh, let's say, dark psychology um, is very interesting for me because I, I read a book recently on it, um, but I didn't quite like the the idea of dark psychology and human manipulation. So I, I think it's an interesting cop- topic to discuss, especially in line with work, um, with all this homeworking and people having a change of work and also social media and the way that social media institutions use human behavior and human data to determine things. So I think a great place to start, Ian, would be where was your fascination with the subject? How did you come about wanting to write about it? Yeah, I've been interested in it for quite a while. Um, Some of my earlier work and one of my last books was about um, high potential. And so I've done a lot of work in kind of the bright side of personality, the bright side of communication and kind of focusing on all the positives of it, which I think is interesting and good, especially from the perspective of trying to select high potential people for um, leadership and organizations, things like that. But the more I was researching that, the more interested I got in the dark side of that and how all of this stuff can go wrong. Um, so this is kind of the examination of that, um, both in what uh, it can be kind of dysfunctional, or problematic in human behavior and personality, but then also how that can be amplified or changed or even manipulated online. Um, I think that's a really, really interesting topic, um, especially now that most of our work, most of our communication for a lot of people has gone completely online. Um, I started writing this book at the very beginning of 2020, so we could kind of see COVID coming, but not really. Um, yeah. But writing this while all of that was emerging and everyone went digital almost overnight in kind of February, March, April of 2020 was really interesting too, because we just saw these effects that I thought were interesting, but not the most kind of prevalent effects in our work or in our lives be Mm. completely overwhelming for everyone. So it was really interesting. Yeah, that must have been an interesting transition for you or seeing that play out in in the world. Um, Interestingly enough, when you were studying it from sort of the brightness aspect of human personality. What were some of the key themes or interest uh, points that you found when you were looking at the dark psychology? What were some of the key themes that really drew you towards it? I think one of the most interesting things for me is that all of the kind of bright side characteristics or all the positive things we look for in colleagues or leaders or um, even at friends and partners is there's always a dark side. Right. So people who are highly conscientious, for example, who are really motivated, really disciplined, really focused, that's usually seen as a good thing in work, but it does have a dark side. And that usually comes out under extreme stress or pressure or challenge. So while a lot of people like to focus on the positives, there's always a dark side to that. 
And if we ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist or don't measure it, assess it, understand it, then it's really, really, really hard to deal with it when it comes up. But if we know what the dark sides of kind of good behaviors are, then we know how to manage it both in ourselves and other people. So like that kind of high conscientiousness, kind of bright side trait, the downside of it is perfectionism. And I don't know, mm. a lot of us have probably worked with people who are really good most of the time, but sometimes they get too bogged down in detail or they get really obsessive or really anally retentive about certain details or when when they're stressed, they have trouble letting go of things. Mm. Um, so I just think it's really interesting to see how these kind of things, when people are under stress or pressure, or a pandemic is a good example of bringing stuff out in people, how people deal with that and manage it or don't necessarily. Yeah, stress is a really interesting one about determining human behavior, I think. Um, I know mm. some, for me personally, I know because I'm quite conscientious a person I've done personality tests so that's one for me and so I'm like really disciplined really motivated but as soon as like stress or fatigue comes in it all just goes out the window <laughs> like anything yeah. anyone says anything to me or I come across something or like a little hurdle it's just like all toys out of the pram it's just it's chaos yeah, I mean, same for me. I always come up fairly high on conscientiousness scores. And the downside for me is sometimes I'm looking five years in the future or two years in the future and I miss stuff that's going on around me. Yes. Um, you know, sometimes, especially if it's a career goal that I've got, like this is something I want to accomplish. I want to have a book published in a year, let's say. Sometimes I let kind of relationships slide or things. I don't focus on things that are actually really important in the moment. So sometimes mm -hmm. I miss important stuff and I forget to, I, to, to slow down and think about that stuff. What are some of the techniques then that you use personally to try and sort of remain present? Because that's something that I struggle with as well. Probably people that yeah, listen to I mean, this struggle few... with this as well. As... Yeah, I think a lot of people do, actually. Um, I mean, one of the things is carving out that time and carving out unstructured time. Um, because I generally like to have a fairly ordered schedule. I like to have uh, plans for next week, next month, next year. And I find generally that works really well in work. But I try not to let those schedules bleed over into the rest of my life now because I used to work a lot of weekends and evenings and especially early in your career, sometimes you need to do that. Um, but it's really important to carve out unstructured time. Make sure you plan time that you haven't, you're not specifically working or you are spending time with family or with friends or whoever's important to you. Um, and to make sure if you're a big planner, then make sure you plan that other time in and you don't yes. just end up letting work take over all of your time because it's very easy for it to do that. It's very easy to do that, especially I think early in your career, because I'm, I'm 28. So there's there's like different things, different goals, I think, um, that you want to do, especially. Um, and then it might change over time. But the, what I've observed for people, especially in their 30s and 40s, is when they have kids and, and they move into that transition of their life, it's almost obligatory. Obviously, if you want to be a good parent or a good you know partner, you have to carve out that time. You can't be obsessed about it. Yeah, exactly. I'm 33. So not much different in age. That's like my yeah. 20s were very, very, very work focused. And yeah. I was not interested in balance at all. Uh, I am a bit more now. <laughs> I think a bit of experience and lessons learned there. Yeah, I think experience probably plays into it. Um, going back yeah. to this idea of um, every person uh, being somewhat good and evil of having the dark side for any good habit. Um, I was reading the book and I, I thought about this quote that I came across while reading the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I don't know if you've read the book, but he has this quote saying the battle line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. And I thought it was a very, very interesting quote because the idea that being in a Soviet Gulag camp, are the individuals or the guards evil people or are they in the circumstance which makes them evil, which I thought was a very interesting distinction that I found between your book and, and his idea. So do you mm -hmm. believe that, because you in the book, you mentioned the Milgram experiment. So yeah. the fact that this idea that obedience of responsibility doesn't absolve people of their own actions. So just because you're in a position where people are doing evil things, that just because you do it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility of doing it. So can you just talk about this idea of individual agency in the context of individuals being responsible for their actions? Yeah, that's a really good question, because I think one of the things that I've talked a lot about in the book is explaining behavior and explaining bad behavior. But explanation is not the same as absolution. So we can definitely understand why when people are given positions of power or authority, especially in very toxic or destructive or um, aggressive environments like a gulag or even a prison or something like that, we can see how that leads to bad behavior. But that's no 
um, excuse for it, that's no reason to forgive it. So people are absolutely responsible for their own behavior, whether they're the prisoner or the prison guard in that kind of situation. Um, and I talk about the Stanford prison experiment as well. But yeah. one of the things that we can understand, especially when we're looking at organizations, is how certain structures and structures of power and organizing people will corrupt most people. And we see that at all times in all places across history, right? If you give people tons of power with very little oversight, with little controls on that, most people will end up doing bad things. A lot of them will do it for reasons that they think are good, right? They're working towards some sort of common goal, some sort of ideology, some sort of focus. They're, you know, the prisoners are bad people and they're the right people are the good people. So they feel that whatever they're doing is right. Um, and different people will come up with different types of bad behavior, which is these dark side personality traits that we see. Some people are have a much stronger tendency to have those aggressive, active, kind of destructive towards other people type behaviors, whereas some people are more likely to withdraw or avoid it or um, might even fight it in some ways. But I think the question you ask about kind of absolution versus understanding or explanation is a really good one, because one of the things that we want to do if we're in the workplace and you know, selecting people or selecting colleagues colleagues or um, selecting leaders is understand where people are likely to go wrong and what that type of bad behavior is, but then also understand the circumstances that are going to lead people to that. Because we see this in companies all the time, too, of uh, where people have a lot of power, influence or money. And if they don't have a lot of oversight, people will end up using those for whatever they think is right or whatever they think is useful or helpful to them or their family or their immediate groups. And you need checks on that kind of power and influence and money, really, because money is a type of power, um, to make sure that people can't go that far off the rails, that people can't use company resources or government resources or social community group resources for their own personal gain instead of what they're actually supposed to be doing in the organization or kind of undermining things and kind of destroying the structures that create that oversight and purpose that is for what the company or the organization, the group is originally intended for. So where does company culture fit into that? Because I think part of that in a company is sort of corporate responsibility, but part of it, probably a larger part of it is company culture, which is sort of the ingrained behaviors. I think that's how you defined it in the book, sort of like the ingrained behaviors and patterns of thinking in an organization. So does it, is it a combination between the both or does company culture sort of supersede corporate responsibility? Yeah, they should be integrated. I mean, a good, healthy corporate culture should have social responsibility embedded in it. It's a part of it. Um, but it's a useful distinction to make between company policy and company culture, because there are sometimes companies that have really strict policies against stealing or manipulating or bullying or all of this stuff. But the company culture completely allows it. And it's interesting to see when that happens in an organization, because the actual behavior on the ground, either whether it's virtually or in an actual office, is determining the company culture, whether or not the policy allows that. Because stuff happens all the time that on paper is not allowed, but it does actually happen. So building company culture is really about determining that behavior in individuals, in groups, and the company as a whole. And you need to make sure that people are actually practicing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, because if people are looking the other way, or oversight doesn't really exist, or you know people know that they can get away with stuff, then eventually some people will, and some people will to extreme excess. The other thing is, if you have those kind of toxic laissez-faire cultures where people kind of use it as <laughs> um, their own personal kind of bank account or power structure or power base, is it'll, mm -hmm. it'll attract people who want to do that. People are relatively good, especially people with these extreme negative dark side personality traits, are good at finding environments where they can get what they want. So if mm -hmm. you create those large groups, organizations or companies that allow that, then it'll attract more people who like that, want that, and want to use it. And the people who don't like that will be initially kind of repulsed by it, will leave, won't stay, um, or will kind of look the other way because it's not worth the consequences of um, trying to deal with those actions if there's no real consequences for them. Or get kicked out of the power structure. Like I see that especially yeah. in with politics and when you have a government with a leader and they have a cabinet and you have individuals either leaving because they don't agree with them or they get kicked out and they have a reshuffle. And then you have a look at the individuals that come in that fit the ideological 
thinking of the leader, but also the personality traits. And it's almost just like a replica or a watered down version of the individual leader. That's something I've observed specifically. And I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, and it, party, it's so but... fascinating to see that because the amount of hubris that always comes into that, because it's always the leader who you can see is being manipulative or you can see what they're doing wrong and they might even be quite open about it. But then the people who come into those positions and end up working for or with them have this idea that, oh, they do this to other people, right? They don't do this to the chosen few or the inner circle, or they're not going to do it to me. That's something they do to other people. And then a month or a year or not long later, it's never that long, really. Then it happens to them and they're shocked. They're appalled. They're like, How could they do this? I've seen this do person do this to so many other people in so many different situations, but I can't believe they did it to me. Yeah, they, they, I, I've seen that as well, especially in, the, in, in, in politics. I think politics is yeah. a specific environment where I feel like these dark psychology or these 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 dark personalities come out to the fore because i think like you said power but specifically mm -hmm. power in the context of politics is i would say different to the power context in business would you say that's the case yeah definitely and it attract politics attracts more people for more different reasons but it attracts a lot of similar personality types and people who are attracted to that um i mean the thing about business or companies too is they vary so much um, right. The people who are attracted to work at a nonprofit might be different than an investment bank versus, you know, other organizations. So there's so much more variation, whereas politics, all of these people get kind of combined into the same small groups and then have to figure out ways of working with each other or not. Mm, definitely. Going back to the individual level uh, in the book, you talk specifically a lot about personality traits and some of the personality traits that can sort of veer over from brightness to the darkness as aspect. And I know we mentioned one with conscientiousness. Um, but you also mentioned personality disorder, disorders and the difference between a trait and a disorder. So can you just define that and why some people perhaps get a personality trait um, confused with a national disorder? Yeah, so I've talked about those terms a little bit in the book. Personality, essentially in broad terms, are consistent is a consistent pattern of thinking, feeling, and behaving. So the interesting thing about personality and why it's useful to study is because in adults, it's very stable. It doesn't really change a lot over the long term. So we know that someone who's conscientious or has the kind of dark side, perfectionistic um, side of conscientiousness, that's not something you're going to change in a workshop or in a couple of weeks of training or something like that. These are really embedded long-term behavioral and thought patterns in people. So they're great for predicting long-term behavior. Um, but when we look at the bright side of personality, that's great. We can say, okay, we want to select for people with these traits, but there's always a dark side of any bright side. Um, so there's two terms I use in the book. One is personality disorders and one is personality styles. So personality disorders are the really kind of severe functional impairments that go along with um, the dark side of personality. So these are kind of clinical psychology terms where people really, really struggle to function in everyday life. That's not what we're talking in the book so much uh, about. It's more about personality styles. So these are the kind of everyday um, variations or manifestations of these extreme levels of personality traits. So we're not necessarily diagnosing narcissists, but we can see some narcissistic, narcissistic tendencies in behaviors in people at work. Or we can see some kind of callous, aggressive, risk-taking behaviors. We're not looking at psychopaths, but we're looking at people who have a bit of a struggle with empathy and have a bit of a struggle with mm. controlling their own impulses sometimes. So we can see these patterns not necessarily in the absolute extremes, but in the more kind of everyday variations that do impact how people think, act, feel, and behave with other people at work. What's the best way for people to actually analyze these traits? Because I think part of the reason is people don't know what the personality styles, as you said, are. So they have difficult, difficulty sort of assigning a behavior to a style. They might see it in observation, but they not, might not know the definition for it. So what's some of the best ways that someone could actually like find what, how behavior links to an actual personality style? Yeah, I think self-assessments are really good. I've actually got a free self-assessment tool on my website, if you can put a link in the show notes. Um, but those self-assessments yeah, are good because they ask you questions about yourself and how you behave and how you think about things. And especially if you're looking at them in the context that you're interested in. Um, so in this case, if we're looking at work and the kind of behaviors and the way you think about people, the way you communicate at work is a really good starting point to um, look at both yourself and other people's personality styles, because it gives you some information about how you're responding to questions. And then it takes these kind of really consistent patterns and says, okay, here's 
how you tend to behave under stress or how you're likely to react to people in these situations at work or how your communication might be affected by that. So I think that's a useful tool as an introduction, um, but it's only part of the picture. So one of the things that you can take from that is some of the self-reflection exercises and think, okay, if we see these patterns, do these come up regularly in my daily interactions with people, in my conversations with colleagues, or in even how I think about my goals, my objectives, what I want to do at work. And I think it's a kind of continual process of self-observation, as well as getting that kind of self-insight from an external evaluation, whether it's a self-assessment or otherwise. Um, and then talking to other people can be really useful too, about how they perceive you and how you both deal with stress. Because that's always a good way to look at the dark side, is what do you do during your most difficult times, or even just minor, minor hassles and difficulties? How do you deal with that? What kind of defenses or behaviors or what do you use to manage stress? Because when the stress gets worse, those behaviors sometimes tend to be amplified. And sometimes we've all got strategies that we use, not necessarily in our day to day lives, but we're used to falling back on. And sometimes those are more private strategies. Sometimes they're very public. But when stuff gets really difficult, then those are the behaviors that sometimes take over because those are what we're used to falling back on. And they're these long term ingrained patterns of behavior. Yeah, I know in the book as well, you you dedicate quite a few chapters to talking about what are some of the actual uh, styles that people have and and what categories they fall into. Because I was reading one specifically, and I think you were talking about, um, where was it? I'm just thinking about, you're talking about unconventional personality within the eccentric mm. personality type. And I was like, are you just doing a bio of me? Because you talk about like how people get stressed and then they don't, they don't particularly like, not like, but they prefer to spend time alone in their own thoughts and social interactions are quite tiring. And then when things get stressful, they sort of detach and they spend a lot of time alone in order to recuperate because socializing in whether it be at work is, is, is quite difficult. So they need time to recover and they prefer work where it's individuals, so they can spend a lot of time thinking. And I was like, is Ian just writing about me? Like, how, 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 does, he, how does he know this? So yeah, in the book, you mentioned lots of different ones. Um, but what's one that tends to be a central personality style that is linked to people being successful? Because I think a lot of people want to be want to be successful. But what is a one personality trait that really determines being successful? So to do that, I have to define success to do what? Um, often we're looking at success in work and leadership. So if we're yes. taking it from that specific perspective, yes, the challenge we'll with, with that. that is the most um, effective traits also tend to be linked to dark side and kind of downfall in leadership. So if we look at the kind of aggressive and dramatic traits, those are the extreme versions of those would be psychopathy and narcissism. Narcissism is a great trait for getting ahead. It's also a great trait for screwing up, pissing people off and <laughs> having an eventual downfall. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is being really good at self-promotion is really, really valued in most organizations, in most workplaces. If you're trying to get promoted quickly, if you're trying to get a pay rise, if you're trying to attract attention, narcissism works really well in the short term. The problem with narcissists is they tend to overpromise and underdeliver and not realize that they're under delivering. So their kind of illusion that they, they create about themselves tends to be very believable to other people initially because they believe it themselves. The problem is they're really vulnerable to that because they don't like when people poke holes in the image that they've created and they don't like when reality pokes holes in the image that they've created. So mm -hmm. when we look at these traits, some of the things we have to do is look at kind of harnessing them at effective and productive levels and not letting them get too far because it's really, really, really tough to change personality. But what we can do is work on changing behaviors. So if we've got a tendency to be good at self-promotion and to use that um, effectively, a big challenge is reining it in. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is in with teams or with trusted partners or mentors or leaders who can tell us, okay, tone it down a bit. You've gone too far in this, um, in this case or this example, or you're promising things you can't deliver on. But the challenge for that is sometimes people with these really extreme traits have trouble making those connections and trusting other people in the long term. So it's mm. very much a double edged sword for these, the ones that tend to be most effective if we're saying getting to the top of a the leadership kind of ladder in a multinational company. The traits that get people there sometimes cause late problems later on. 
and in the book as well, you focus a lot on Donald Trump. So I feel like this example comes into play. So there's a narcissist. Speaking of narcissists, helped yeah. him, speaking of narcissists uh, helped him get into the position. But obviously, would you assess the same reasons? It, it was his downfall as well. Well, we've only seen half a downfall. He's going to be back. But um, yeah, I think <laughs> he, <laughs> he's trying to get back anyway. The second time. Um, I think, well, that's the thing. That's the trouble with that kind of level of narcissism is it's that constant creating of an image. And in some ways, you could see it as a positive thing if you say, well, he never gives up. <laughs> yeah. Despite everything that happens, yeah. every trial, every, you know, whatever, um, impeachment, he's going to keep coming back because he has this image of himself that is the most powerful man in the world. And the problem is when narcissists get that kind of thing validated by an electorate is it's very hard to puncture that kind of image, that narcissism, that idea of who you are, if you are have that level of kind of um, extreme, um, not just ambition, but kind of belief of yourself as this kind of godhead, figurehead kind of person. But it's interesting to look at how someone gets there, because that is, for Donald Trump, he has the most behavioral evidence, the most behavioral data that he's essentially published about himself over decades and decades and decades, right? Like there is no TV opportunity he won't turn down. There is no you know, um, publicity opportunity that he won't take. So we can see over decades, all of that behavior, that kind of self-promotional behavior that I think for many years was moderated through ghostwriters and producers and very good editors to kind of create this image of him um, that now when you give him a mic for two hours at a rally, you see all of the stuff that comes out. Um, but he's someone who's very willing to just talk for hours and hours and hours and say whatever. And he's very good at picking up on what people respond to and doesn't really seem to have that impulse to kind of censor or shut himself down, um, which obviously in his mind, you know, if he keeps talking, that's <laughs> probably the best person in the world that could possibly be talking. So why would he stop? Um, but mm -hmm. then he's managed to use that really effectively over the decades to just keep coming back in different positions. And I mean, the money helps. Without money, he would be probably ranting on a street corner. But it's really interesting to see in politics how with a political machine and with money and savvy political operators and quite good um, technology and tools behind it to amplify that kind of behavior and message and communication, people can get really, really far. And sometimes it's hard to stop them. Mm. And I think in the in the book as well, you obviously the part of it is about social media and the way that these tools are being used, whether they be the algorithms or the actual social media websites. So what role do they play in pushing this 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 content or this extremist ideologies? Because you you gave a really interesting statistic that I wanted to bring up because I read it and I thought it was really interesting. You said while ten percent of users on Twitter generate eighty percent of the tweets, if only twenty percent of the population uses Twitter, then the most outspoken two percent of the population is dominating the conversation. So we look at social media websites, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I don't think it particularly matters, but there's such a small population who are actually pushing these you know, these thoughts and these ideas and these companies are pushing them themselves and this message is out there. So yeah, what role do these social media companies play in, in pushing these, these, these darker traits and personalities? Yeah, I, they play a huge role more and more so lately and more and more so as they've, um, more people have joined them and more influential people have joined them. Um, it's interesting to see how much social media platforms have changed over the last 10 years because they are completely different platforms. They're completely different beasts than yeah. they were 10 years ago when it was just college students planning parties on Facebook, right? Yeah. Um, now they're huge, huge media empires. And it's interesting to see how much influence people can have when the algorithms, and we've seen a lot of information come out about how <laughs> deliberately Facebook is a good example of algorithms pushing deliberately toxic content because that's what people engage with. Right. That's what gets people most activity. That's what gets people most clicks. And that's what they promote because it gets people engaged, whether it's angry, worried, stressed. It makes people engaged with those. And we see a lot of data, a lot of information that social media platforms deliberately try and manipulate people's emotions or to play on the emotions that already exist. Because if you can make people have an emotional response, you can make them react to your product, whether your product is the platform or whether it's the advertisements on it. Um, so they really, really amplify these a lot. And we can see as kind of 
politicians like Trump will really take advantage of that. And he really found his niche on Twitter because the kind of stuff he posts doesn't need to be factual, but most people don't check it anyway. It doesn't need to be really insightful. It's just a soundbite that people kind of play off. And I think a lot of people use that stuff to build up their own kind of image about either what someone else is or what a party is like, what an organization is like. And there's a lot of projection that goes on, right? So you can have these short, quick statements that are sort of catering to specific people, but they're fairly generic. Um, we see some of the dog whistles that mean certain things to far right or extremist groups. Um, and the same thing happens with far left pol politicians too. They take advantage yeah. of that just as much, sometimes just not as effectively. But there are platforms that are made to get and grab and hold attention. And everything about them is designed to keep people on the platforms for as long as possible. And what really, really does that is anger, disgust, sadness, and stress. So we see if people get really, really focused on these and caught up in them, it creates this own kind of little world that people live in based on who they're connected with or who they're following and mm -hmm. isolates you from everyone else because the kind of stuff that you're clicking on or reading, you don't even need to click on it anymore. They know what you're scrolling past and stopping on. Then that's yeah. more of what you're going to get fed. So people can kind of build up their own bubbles really, really quickly. And we see that even more so now where more people are spending more time online and less in person because mm -hmm. your immediate social environment, if you spend a lot of time on social media platforms, is that social media platform. Yeah, and I think you called it emotional contagion, didn't you? You said the idea of the emotion of the people that you're following gets pushed through to you. So if you're constantly getting, let's say, barraged by far right propaganda, propaganda and i want to talk about the difference between marketing and propaganda because i think that's an interesting <laughs> distinction as well but this idea that the people that you follow really determines how you behave so these platforms are affecting the way that you behave and if you don't know how they're affecting you it gets very difficult to to determine whether your thoughts are your thoughts and feelings or whether it's just the people that you follow yeah and that's why i think i hope i made the distinction well in the book is that i'm not saying everyone should completely get off social media and you know shut it down turn it off never use yeah, it I, I don't think um, you said that i think it's more like be aware of what their purpose is exactly yeah and i think people should be very aware and the same way you'd use mindfulness in your own kind of work or life use it on social media and yeah. instead of just kind of reacting to stuff observe how you feel when you're reading posts and if you if something makes you really mad or really stressed or really worried take a pause and think about why why you're following that person <laughs> is it someone you know is it a close friend is it someone that you want to be seeing that kind of stuff all the time because if you click on it and comment of it you're going to get 10 times as much of that kind of content if facebook can determine that you're interested or you have a reaction in that way then you're going to get so much more of it and it's funny because those kind of stress responses are harder con to control, um, especially if those stress responses are information seeking, right? There's something bad. I have to figure out what it is and either talk about it, research it, learn more about it. But if you do that on social media, it's going to amplify whatever you're shown or whatever content you're um kind of shows up on your feed more and more. So I really, really, really want to encourage everyone, not necessarily to shut it off, but be really, really conscious about who you're following and why and how you interact with other people in the same way, hopefully you are in your kind of normal life who you decide who you want to spend time with or be friends with and understand how that stuff is affecting you. Because in some ways, all of this is personalized and customized to you. But at the same time, you can be customizing it yourself. So mm. use the unfollow button, choose whether or not you want to accept connections with people who are pushing crazy, strange, weird stuff, um, and choose what kind of experience you want to have online. Because if you do choose to structure your own kind of social media content like that, you can do it very effectively. But if you mm. just do it passively as a consumer of information, then the algorithms are going to take complete control and it's probably going to be related to stress responses instead of positive ones. I think knowing why you use the platforms is very important. As someone who creates content on social media, I don't use it as a way of getting information like news or that type of stuff or reading mm -hmm. like in the same way of consuming information. I just use it to post stuff. <laughs> and that's taken quite a while because I think when I started, it was very much consumption. But then I really limited who I followed because some of the people are just they just annoy me incessantly. And I'm just like, get, get out. I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to see you. I just don't want to yeah. see. You. I, and, and, and sometimes ignorance is bliss to a degree where you're just like, I just don't want to see it because it's affecting the way I see the world and see myself. And it's just just get out of my life. <laughs>
Yeah, exactly. Or see it only when you want to. So if it's maybe let's use the example of a family member who you don't want to be on the phone with and talking to every day because you know that they're <laughs> it's not going to be the most pleasant experience. But maybe you check in with them once a year or you see them at a you know family dinner or something. Use the same thing for your social media. Maybe check up on people or have a little chat with someone online occasionally. But you don't need to be seeing everything they're posting about their political and religious beliefs and what's going on in their work and their personal life every single day for parents paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, yeah. So again, just kind of figure out really what you want to get from social media if you're using it, how you're using it and why. Um, but that kind of sitting on, lying on the couch, endlessly scrolling through your phone for hours, not healthy behavior. Yeah, death scrolling. Avoid yeah. it. <laughs> yep. Avoid the death scroll. Actually, <laughs> one, 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 one tip that I, I came across, which has been really helpful for me is on, on an iPhone, and I'm sure other phones do it as well. You can set limits on the time spent on social media and it comes up and it just says you're, you've reached your time limit. Do you mm. want to continue? And you have to actively press to then continue on it. And that's just a good reminder yeah. for, for me, especially if I'm on it and it says you've used up your let's like, take half an hour for the day on Instagram. You're like, well, I should probably be doing something else now. Which is yeah, a good and it's hack. amazing it's how quickly that, that half hour or an hour can go by too. <laughs> and and it's easy, it's really interesting how easy it, it accumulates because you can be spending, let's say, five minutes in between doing things. Then the mm. next thing you know, you're like, it's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I've already used my half an hour. You're like, oh, this is crazy. It's amazing how quickly that time just just goes. Yeah. And the other thing I'd recommend is turn off notifications. If you have oh, social media apps on your phone, which I don't, that's just a personal choice, but I don't because I don't want them to take my attention in that way. But notifications, I absolutely loathe. <laughs> I can't say it enough. Just because that's 100%. the platform reminding you, it's saying, come back, come back. Someone likes you. Someone's interested in you. Someone might annoy you. Look at what this person said. And it's constantly trying to get you to come back to the platform. Even if it's to spend those two or three minutes every hour, it's amazing how quickly those add up. Um, and because you're interacting with the platform, they know exactly what you're going to react to, when to send you the notifications, um, and how to do that in a way that's going to keep you coming back. So turn the notifications off, use social media, but use it on your own terms and decide how you're using it. Don't let the platforms tell you how to use it. Notifications are so funny because I, I had this experience where I bought this watch and it had notifications attached to my phone. And it's when I started posting on Instagram a lot to, on, on the book blog and I was getting like hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of likes for a, a book photo. And I'd be sitting there at my desk and I'd be doing it. Obviously, I'd be working and then I'd, I'd have the thing that I'd post during lunchtime. And I'd just be sitting there and it'd be like buzz on my on my wrist. Buzz, buzz, yeah. buzz, buzz. And I'm just like, I, this needs to stop. Like, I just can't be doing with this notification business anymore. So ever since that day, I've just turned the notifications off. And I just don't like the little red things on top of the apps. And it's just, just leave it clean. And if I want to go on it, I can go on it. Yeah. It's funny, though, because those are specifically designed to kind of fire your neurotransmitters and say, oh, look, I'm popular. I'm popular. I'm popular. People like me. People like me. People like me. And to do it constantly. And one of the things I find most interesting about those notifications, I know this happens on Facebook. I'm sure the other platforms do it, too, is those are not real time notifications. They, stay, mm. they stagger those out. So they drip feed you those likes. So you're constantly getting the notification. If 100 people liked your post in five minutes, they might stagger those likes out, out over two hours because then it's keeping you coming back or keeping your attention on that specific post. And it's saying, what it's telling you is reinforcing that post more of that content. We want more of that content. That got us a lot of eyeballs. Keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. Um, and it's funny over time how that can really add up and make a difference. I, do you know what? I feel that's the case, actually, they stagger it because I get likes sometimes for things I posted three weeks ago. But I, the way, I thought the way the algorithm works is someone only sees it on a day. So, like, how would people seeing that if it's unless they're going to the page? But I, I, yeah, I, I it's mean, it's a mix like, of I, I, it's, Yeah, it could be yeah, that maybe it's it a could mix be of that things. because I also get notif or not, I see posts sometimes this is LinkedIn, but I'll see stuff sometimes that it's a week or two old, but it's probably someone that I interact with regularly. So their algorithm knows that, oh, maybe you've missed this content, but we think you like it. So we're going to keep trying to show it to you. And yeah. so they do that too. They stagger stuff for other people, but they also stagger the notifications you get. They're not necessarily in real time. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I think self-awareness is, is a big thing of that. And I think in, in the book, you talk about self-report. I, I can't remember what context it was, but I remember reading something about self-report, which is this idea of knowing who you are um, and having a level of self-awareness. And being able to see how you act in, in different contexts. And one thing I really wanted to bring up, and this is specifically in the work context, is we get assessed, especially in interviews, um, and we have CVs. 
and we get tested on competency questions about okay what situation did you act in where you experienced leadership or overcoming a challenge all these types of things how difficult is it or are cvs and interviews flawed to a degree because it's really difficult to know ourselves in that respect or to take these ideas about what we think of ourselves and convey that to another person do you think like interviews and cvs are flawed to a degree because we can't really express ourselves in that way Oh, they're fundamentally flawed. Um, interviews and CVs are one of the least predictive assessment measures for predicting who's going to be successful. Um, part of the problem is that you don't necessarily know how much self-insight someone has. Most people have a lot of insight about themselves. They're generally, to a pretty good degree, have a decent degree of awareness, but not everyone does. And from a CV, you can't tell who those people are. Um, they're sometimes a good indicator. So a CV might give you a good list of questions to ask if you understand um, kind of what you want to get from the role and the general idea of what their past experience is. But interviews are notoriously unreliable. There are good interviewers and you can have very good, well-structured interviews that are decent predictors of potential. But the problem is most employers are not great at doing interviews. So they're not hugely valid. Um, that's why some of the self-assessment techniques, like the self-assessment tests that you can take, um, are sometimes a good initial indicator, because those also give you a sense of the questions you want to ask. I mean, going back to conscientiousness that we talked about before, if someone's saying they're highly conscientious, really well organized, always on time, that's a good indicator that you can say, OK, they think they're like that. Do they show up on time to the interview? Are they well organized? Have they done a bit of research about this company? Do they know who we are or what we're doing? And so if you have someone's description of themselves, then it's really easy or really straightforward to evaluate it against their own behavior and the reality. So it's really interesting when you're looking at longer terms and for job and career development is understanding how much self-awareness other people have about themselves and sometimes about awareness of other people and how they interact with them. But you always want to back this up in behavior. So is the way that they're describing themselves, talking about themselves, the way they think about themselves, is that reflective of reality? Because for most people, it generally is. People have a pretty good insight about that. But going back to narcissists, for example, they may have this hugely inflated idea of themselves, this massive ego, and this idea of who they think they are. And they can't quite separate that, who they really are from who they want to be. Their image mm -hmm. of who they want to be is who they are. But the behavioral evidence for that quickly piles up, right? So you can see when what someone says about themselves doesn't match their behavior when they're continually promising things that they don't deliver on. Sometimes people get good at developing strategies with teams to get other people to cover for them or, you know, stealing credit for other people's work or other ways of managing those expectations and delivering what they promised in a different way. But really what you want to do is evaluate people's behavior. And the only way you can do that effectively is over the long term. So if you've got a longer history of observed behavior, then you can make those predictions with a lot better accuracy. Do you think that people are going to move towards these types of tests? And I know you have your own, which you, you said earlier, but do you think people are going to be moving towards this type of personality testing and in interviews and CVs going forward? Do you see a change happening? Yeah, I have seen that happening even over the last probably decade. It's happened a lot more. Um, these are really useful, but I do want to stress they're not 100% of the picture. So with a really good mm -hmm. personality assessment, we can evaluate about 20 or 30% of someone's potential performance, which is pretty good. I mean, if you can do that in an organization, that is one of the best metrics you're going to get, but it's also only part of the picture, right? So a personality test gives you some indication of someone's long-term behavior. But if we take someone who's 19 year, years old, for example, you can say, well, this is a high potential leader based on these personality traits, and we think they can do this, but they need the training, they need the experience, they need the right organizational culture. Because if you take someone who's high potential and put them in a toxic environment, that potential could go very, very wrong. Um, so I think they're useful up to an extent. They're really useful for self-insight. They're really useful for development, but they're not a silver bullet, right? So you can't tell everything about someone by a personality assessment. You can get a chunk of it, um, assuming they're relatively self-aware and relatively willing to disclose that about themselves. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, human behavior is a lot more complex and nuanced than that. Where does, where does this idea of, of learning from or being willing to fail um, come into this idea of uh, understanding personality and the darker side of personality? Because I think one of the things that people struggle with is this idea of dealing with personal failure and attributing it to their own personality.
-hmm. where does that come into understanding how we see ourselves and how we act and this fear of failure? Yeah, well, it comes into personality in the sense of the more severe these personality traits are, the more kind of severely um, impaired people are, the more trouble they'll have with that. Right. So some people have kind of tendencies. They maybe have a little tendency for self-promotion or risk taking or whatever. And it's kind of in a normal, healthy way. But they get to be dysfunctional at the extremes when certain patterns of behavior are so ingrained that people can't see it in themselves. They can't reflect on it. Um, but what we can do to really mitigate that and to help for development is look at relationships, because a big, big issue with fear of failure is worry about destroying the relationship or disappointing the other person or disappointing somebody you're working with or how they're going to react to that. And that is, in some cases, that fear is overblown. In some cases, that fear is entirely reasonable, right? Like there are definitely some jobs, some positions, some people who are not accepting of failure. So I think there is a understandable fear of that that comes in because there are real risks to failing. But what we can do to mitigate that mm -hmm. is strengthen the relationships. So to take those risks and to be able to learn from failure, you need to do it with a manager or a mentor or within a team who can understand that. And that those relationships have to be developed on both sides. So you have to be fairly forthcoming about saying, okay, this is how I deal with stress. And this is what I do when things go wrong. Um, that's sometimes it just either work or personal relationships, I always recommend people when they're really angry or pissed off or stressed, explain sure. to the other person yes. why, because people generally tend to think that the other person is angry at them. So if you can understand what then and explain 100%. what your stress response is, how it happens, sometimes that can prevent some of those miscommunications or that conflict early on. Um, but developing that understanding and empathy, not just in yourself, but building it in teams is absolutely fundamental for helping people take risks, manage failure and the growth that comes from that. So do you think that failure affects an individual by the relationship they have? How does it affect the own personal image? Does, does it affect it to the same degree or is it just do they have to use their relationships with other people to determine that? It depends. So actually, that's a really good place to come back to personality styles, because how people kind of govern and understand and manage their relationships with other people is affected by these personality styles. So we see those two um, personality styles, sensitive and selfless, that the people's self image is really, really, really tied up in how other people see them. And they really want to be useful mm. and helpful and kind of giving, charitable, kind, whatever it is, but they see themselves in how they're reflected back by other people. So they need to feel useful in the eyes of other people, whereas some, the more kind of wary, solitary, unconventional are the opposite, right? They really focus more inward yes. and on their own kind of developing the, that type of self-worth and their image of themselves and are much more both resilient, but sometimes impervious to criticism. So understanding the styles and how they manage relationships is a good place to explore that. Yeah, because that, that was my question, because I think that I think it's determined somewhat by environment as well. So I, mm -hmm. Do you think that's the case where someone has a particular trait and then they're in an environment and it changes how they that how that style is formed, if that makes sense, like the, the environment changes it? Because I remember when I went to my first grad scheme, my first job in my grad scheme, I felt as if I was quite like it's selfless in that way where my image was dictated about how helpful I was. And if I felt like I was being helpful and I was waiting for feedback of being helpful, it sort of spurred me on and motivated me. Mm -hmm. But then that sort of quickly deteriorated in the environment that was, I was in and it, it more moved to let's determine how things are by my own view of things. Um, and then my stubbornness came into play, which is <laughs> <laughs> my inability to, uh, to, 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 to get feedback. So yeah, yeah. does environment, like how does environment shape that? Yeah, environment does shape it. So personality traits are fairly stable, but we interact in different ways depending on the environment. And I mean, one of the things, one of the things the book talks about a lot is about how that varies or doesn't vary in physical versus digital environments, because we see that certain environments can yes. elicit certain behaviors. Most environments are designed to elicit some sort of behavior in people, right? Yeah. Like offices are designed, hopefully, to help people be more productive, to get their work done, to focus on specific things that are related to their working environment and their customers, clients, stakeholders, whoever it is. Um, grocery stores like supermarkets are a good example of that too. They are structured to create a certain type of behavior. You're supposed to 
go in one side, look at certain places on the shelf, not look at certain places on the other, de-emphasize emphasize others. But then digital environments are the same, right? Like it's exactly what we were talking about before is Facebook or Twitter are designed to create certain types of behaviors, certain frequencies of behaviors. Yeah. Um, or your example of going into a job, how you view yourself or how you want other people to view you or expect um, other people to provide feedback about kind of who you are and what value you're providing is going to be shaped by that environment. Um, the personality styles don't really change very much, but how those styles interact with the environment does. And again, that's part of self-awareness. And then part of it is really a lifelong task of figuring out how to balance your own self-image with that other people have of you, right? So how much of that kind of yes. core, what you find useful, interesting, valuable about your own work do you see reflected back from other people? How interested in that are other people or not? And how do you manage that in a kind of ongoing relationship? What are some of the techniques to best manage that for an individual? Like I, I've found some techniques to be helpful for me, um, specifically journaling or writing about it, writing about experiences over time, and then picking up on patterns and seeing where I made a mistake or where things can be improved. What are some of the techniques that perhaps you use personally or, or that people can use in order to, to help that? Yeah, journaling is a really good one. Any sort of self-reflection that, especially that slows you down is really good. Um, so if, you're, if you can especially look back at those longer term patterns of behavior about yourself, um, especially sometimes in the way you've written something five years ago might not even be the way you think of things now. It's interesting to see how that's changed or why. Um, those are really useful Definitely. techniques. Um, 360 feedback is a really good one. This is more used in organizations, but taking a bit of time to slow down and understand how people see you or ask how people see your work or your behavior in certain contexts is really useful too. Um, it's not always possible in every environment or within every relationship, but having those conversations is good, especially if you're someone who gets nervous about those conversations, having them in a structured way is really good. So, you know, like we do in an interview, but just, you know, two colleagues having a list of questions about their work or what's important to them and then really discussing those in a kind of private or safe or relatively kind of congenial environment where people are um, not stressed. Because if you can do these things in a stress-free environment, you can have a lot more insight and you can react to things in different ways, whereas sometimes our natural defenses come out when we're stressed. So whatever you can do to get yourself more relaxed, less stressed, and having those conversations with colleagues, managers, bosses, whoever, in a safe, stress-free environment or as stress-free as possible is really, really useful. And the other thing to remember too is if people give you feedback, always take it with a grain of salt. Definitely listen to it <laughs> and integrate it and find ways of understanding why they're saying that, but also think about why they're saying that in that context and think about why you're reacting to it in certain ways. So listen to it and understand that's it such a that's such a good point that's such a good point because someone who's early in their career might look at an, their manager as being like this all-knowing sage to a degree mm -hmm. of this person that you know knows their job really well as an expert in their field but you'll quickly come to realize that they don't really know that much um well they might do but uh, my yeah. experience <laughs> that hasn't been the case um <laughs> and their feedback is more determined about how they see you as a person more than perhaps what your they have a lens. Yeah, and they're looking and they, at you that, that in the role lens you're in, might right? Be determined so looking... about how they feel about their job. Yeah, exactly. So they're looking at you from their role and they're looking at you in your role. So they might have really useful information, but it's still from a relatively narrow scope. Like it's not a description of who you are completely as a person. It's not your entire life. It's one viewpoint to another viewpoint. And so if you look at it in that context, you could say, okay, from this point of view, this is who this person thinks I am. Can I see how I would behave in ways, act in ways, speak in ways that would make them think that? Is that something I want to change or is it something I can change or is it something to look at? Um, and how, yeah, how do you reflect on that? But I think taking that time and the space to reflect on it in different ways is useful. I think this goes back to what we were talking about when we were talking about um, conscientious people about setting time aside for quiet time. Because I think that's what the quiet time is used for, isn't it? It's for... And self-reflection doesn't have to be something that is like structured to the degree that you have to sit down and you have to write about it and you have to really think about it because you could be doing, let's say, an activity where you're just on a walk or with your family members and you're just sort of just sitting around and that 
so you just give your subconscious time to think about things i mean that happens to me mm -hmm. like sometimes i'm playing with my niece and i come across something and i'm like oh my god that happened like three years ago and that's why it happened yeah i know i love that too i love to take long walks and i think they're a really really good kind of time and space to kind of think about that and reflect on stuff without trying to force it too hard just kind of more of a mindfulness exercise to see what comes up, especially when something comes up from like five years ago that you still haven't really resolved for yourself or figured out why it happened and kind of look at it from other angles or look at it from other relationships or perspectives and try and figure it out a bit more. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, having that time is really useful. The other thing I think is reflecting without it being in a negative way of trying experiences that you don't necessarily like or wouldn't normally do. And it's fine to do something and not like it or not like the role you're in or not like how you react in that environment or whatever that is. But also reflect on those kind of things too, of think about who you don't want to be as well as who you do want to be. Think of roles you don't want to be in as well as who as roles you do want to be in. But think of why and think of how you're reacting to them under the circumstances and how other people are relating to you. And if you can figure out why that is, then you can have a good explanation for determining whether or not you want to do it in the future that's such a good point like determining who you don't want to be rather than who you want to be is a lot easier so if you want to think of, it's a lot easier to see someone you don't want to be and be like oh i don't want to be like that person rather than thinking oh who do i actually want to be that's such a good point yeah especially when you reflect sometimes because i've had those in early managers where i at the time i thought well i don't want to be that person and then 10 years later you go okay actually i could see exactly why they were acting in that way in that environment at that time so maybe i need to figure yes. out a way to <laughs> um, give people a bit more space <laughs> or understanding in the future if they're acting in that way in that environment yeah, I think that's where the empathy comes into it, because you, yeah. you understand that everything's just context and it's not uh, d definitive, if that makes sense. Like someone might be acting in a certain way, not because they are bad or they're inherently evil. It, just so many things come into play, whether it be, you know, personal circumstances, what's happening outside of work, you know, their personal relationships, you know, stress, fatigue, all these things come into play. So that's where I think taking a step back and not being immediately... Um, aggressive is probably not the right word, but it, it, immediately accusative of an individual um, is, is important. Yeah. And that's why I think, again, those pauses are really important. Even if it's a 10 second pause before you react or judge or think about things in a certain way, take a moment, step back from it. If you can, it's really hard to do when you're stressed or challenged really or in a really hard. difficult situation, but try and avoid yeah. those immediate snap judgments. And then after, if you've managed to take that pause, reflect on why you made that snap judgment, because it is a judgment based on your experience, your history, your understanding of people. But if you can put a little bit of distance between that and reflect on why you're making that evaluation of people or why you think people are making that evaluation of you, sometimes there's really interesting information that you can get at in yourself or from other people in that little mm. space of that pause. Yeah, I know a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, an author on the podcast, um, Donald Robertson, who um, specializes in cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, always struggle to say that. And uh, <laughs> he talks about this idea of cognitive distancing. So this idea of see yourself sort of from a high level view about how you act and don't get too involved in your emotions, determining your personality, you know, have have some distance between the problems and the way that you react to them, because in that distance, you can actively analyze why you acted in that way and, and how you can act differently in the future. Yeah. And sometimes those realizations can be a bit uncomfortable. So I think a lot of people, especially um, <laughs> speaking for myself, but highly conscientious, sometimes one of the reasons that conscientious people get really busy is to avoid that pause, because sometimes there's a lot of stuff going on. No one does everything perfectly all of the time. And so keeping that momentum stops those pauses because sometimes there's uncomfortable realizations there that you don't necessarily want to see or don't have time to see when everything's difficult or everything's moving really fast. So again, try and take those pauses whenever you can, but especially when you yes. have this space and kind of mental acuity and you feel good enough and you're confident enough in yourself that you can deal with those revelations if they come up. I think a personal revelation for me being conscientious again i think we're both somewhat similar in this degree is saying am i busy because it's a distraction or am i busy because i have to get things done mm -hmm. it's like what's the distinction between busyness being because we all have we all know people as well that say oh you know i'm so busy and it always seems like they're always busy but is that a distraction from something that's going on in their lives or are they actually you know 
just really, really busy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it a coping mechanism, right? Because sometimes being busy yeah. is a coping mechanism. So you do the things mm -hmm. that you feel that you can control or that you want to control or where you feel you're being productive to avoid other stuff that you don't want to deal with. And that's, I mean, it's a fairly legitimate co um, coping mechanism <laughs> because it could be very productive yeah. unless it goes too far. Um, because if you have, you know, a situation where, you know, a partner or a family member or something is ill, or it could be a very bad or a very good situation, but you're avoiding it in the space that you feel very safe and comfortable and secure, which might be work or productivity or that kind of focus. It's a, it's one way to avoid all sorts of other stuff. Um, but usually doing that creates problems further down the road because you can't avoid stuff forever, <laughs> no matter how busy you are. So sometimes it's important to reflect on why you're choosing to do certain things. And even if you don't think you're choosing to do things, you, maybe. Yeah, exactly. I think that goes back to sort of a key element of this conversation, which is having that awareness and, and seeing yourself and why you're acting in certain ways and, and having that reflection and, and awareness i think that is a as a key theme mm -hmm. uh, we've discussed many things in this podcast and it's been it's utterly fascinating um one thing i want to end on though is like what are some of the key takeaways that you think you want people to take from the, this podcast but also from the book itself and obviously i encourage everyone to read it but it's just what are some of the key themes that you wanted to sort of get across and i know you ended the book with with three so i think it'd be great just to talk about those and 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 why you think this subject is interesting and, and what you want people to take from it. Yeah, I mean, one of the main things that I really want people to take from it is that one of the reasons I study psychology in the context of work is because work takes up so much of our lives. And I think if it's done well and in a positive way, work can be a force for good. Employers, managers, organizations, work teams can make a positive impact in people's life. It can really, really change how people see themselves, how people understand themselves, and how people build um, talent and confidence and understanding and empathy and all of this stuff. So I think if we're aware of ourselves and how we react to other people and how we other people react to us. There's a lot we can do in building more healthy, more constructive workplaces um, and understanding that there's a dark as well as a bright side and it's there in everyone is a huge part of that mm -hmm. because it's really, really, really easy to judge other people's dark side or their bright side without seeing the other or with deliberately ignoring the other, but understanding that both of those sides are there in everyone. And if you understand it and you see it, often you can help people um, when they need help or prevent things from going wrong because you know how to prevent some of the worst um, behaviors or problems that come out during stressful times. So I think especially as managers and organizations, understanding that and understanding the people you work with is really, really useful. Mm. That's why I love that quote that I talked about at the beginning um, by Scholz and I think it was a Jungian, Jungian quote as well, another word I struggle with, um, being the, the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every person. Because I think yeah. once you understand that, you're more empathetic to when people have negative traits or, or darker traits, because you can understand that that's so what can be circumstantial. But you also, if someone is acting in a somewhat darker way, you can understand that they have a brightness and you need to sort of see the brightness and try and get that out of them as well. So I think it's really good because people like to just put, put someone in a box and say, look, they're just evil and they're every part of every cell in their body is evil. But mm -hmm. that's just a, such a negative way to see it. And I, I just don't think that's the case. Well, it's not the case. Yeah. And it can get unhealthy too, right? Because if that's your conception of the world, that there's a lot of evil people out there and people do all of these bad things, and that's what you focus on, um, then that starts to create and construct your world and how you see other people as well as yourself in some ways. So understanding that yes. complexity and that nuance and that empathy um, I think for other people can really help um, with some help, self-empathy too. It can really help with that self-insight. Unfortunately, the end of our conversation was slightly cut off, so I wasn't able to do the usual outro with Ian. However, I've attached all of his social media links as well as his personality test that you can take, and I'll put it in the description below so you can go check that out. But hopefully you found this conversation very interesting and you can take some really interesting takeaways from it between assessing personality traits and styles and also getting a better understanding about some of the behaviors that you have or even the people around you that can contribute to this darker side. Like with anything, there's a bright side and a dark side. So understanding the differences between those two in behavior, but also just having an awareness of them is very important as well. So thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you did find 
find it very helpful and informative. Please do share this podcast with anyone that you think will find it valuable. We've had some amazing authors that have come on this podcast to talk about their books and their ideas. So please do share. Thanks again. And I'll see you in the next episode.